Hello folks, welcome back to another splurge of Hobby Nightmares. This one is 17 pages long on my old script here, so it might be a bit of a long one, so stick with me and we'll have some fun. If you like what I do, the subscribe button is down below, the Patreon button is also down below if you really like what I do and want to buy me a beer or something over the weekend, there is something you can do and it would actually help me out quite a lot. Something that also helps me out is if you're getting any models towards the summer, the summer tournament season, then head on over to Composite Games to get any of your models and use the promo code Northern Exile down below whilst you're there to get yourself 5% off your order at checkout. So, I need to get on with this because there are three Hobby Nightmares, all of which are rather long. Let's jump in, shall we? Well, I'll say rather long. I think they, they sort of make up for a long video in and of themselves when you add them all together. But anyway... Derek says, Hi North, uh, I have been listening to you for quite some time now, and I lost my job not too long ago. Oh, that sucks, man. Horrible. With your story of returning back to school and my girlfriend encouraging me to go back, I just started my engineering degree. Also, sorry for the poor grammar. I'm not as good as I would like to be in English. Um, I have attached three pictures of my models and a picture of my dog, Nala. Well, we can't not look at these, can we now? All right. Let's have a little look-see. Oh, I like... Are these uh, Minotaurs? That's cool. Very cool. I like it. Look the old Minotaurs. I like the feathering on the uh, on the blade. You need to, like, show me a bit more of that. Is that a, a Primark in the background? Is that Altharius? Anyway. Yeah, lovely feathering on the sword. I need to see that. That looks really, really, really nice. I think there are Minotaurs too. And Doggo. Nala. Ah, isn't she lovely? Ah. Uh, oh, dear. Anyway, I'll leave that on for a little bit. I have been in and out of the hobby since I was 16. When I grew up, or where I grew up, we did not have a hobby store or a public place to play. So we had to go to one of our group houses. I don't know if it's important, but it helps to paint a picture. We were six guys, all of the same age range. To this day, I am still in touch with all of them. You might be wondering why I'm writing to your Hobby Nightmares channel. Well, like I said, we were teens and dumb and uh, not very nice people. We all made mistakes and did stupid things that would be considered nightmares. In short, we all had nightmares at any given time. Let's start with Angry. I'm calling him Angry because he was a sore loser. He really improved and is not a sore loser anymore or, or not anywhere near the, the level it used to be. Still, when he has a really, really bad game, you can catch a glimpse in his eyes of him wanting to flip the table, but it never happened, so that's all good. I had just come back to the group. I was out of the hobby for about a year. After another friend, I'd call him Chad, because I don't really have any story of him being awful during a game. Had sold me on Minotaurs since I love Greek stuff and I was hooked really fast. So, Chad helped me paint all of my minis and convert my Cato Sicarius into a proper Minotaur leader. The picture is attached. Yeah, we saw him before. Good stuff. Small tangent here. I had brought from him uh, enough for a small army. Five Terminators in which he found a Chaos Helmet that had horns on it to fit the army aesthetic for the sergeant, a dreadnought, a librarian, two 10-10 squad of marines, and, a, and two razorbacks. And I had to buy outside of... Sorry. All I had to buy outside of that was Cato Sicarius and a Vindicator. So, I went to his house to assemble my newly acquired tank. Since I had forgotten my glue, Chad lend, lended me his. Uh, lent. He lent you his. However, it was super glue and not plastic glue, and I had never used it before. So, I was gluing my tank, and since it took quite some time to stick, I was holding the parts firmly in my hands to let the glue do its work. I had done most of the framing, and then I turned to Chad and said, and I quote, Hey, look, I think that's pretty good, what do you think? He answered, Um, pass it to me, I want to see if the seams are good. So I went to put it on the table for him to grab, but unfortunately, I did not let give enough time for the glue to, to dry and none of the parts stuck on each other. Funny thing was about superglue, did you know that it was invented for military use to close open wounds? So it dries really fast on skin. 
No, yeah, that, that, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I always wondered. I always got annoyed. I was like, why are you sticking to me? <laughs> Not the model. Yeah, that, that, I, I do that all the time. Like, my missus hears me do that at least once a day. Like, why? <laughs> why are you sticking to me? The plastic's right there. You've gone out your way to stick to me. That's why. Okay, cool. Well, I didn't know that. Now, you've probably guessed it. While part did not really glue together, sorry, while, while the part did not really glue together, they were now parts of my hands. <laughs> Have you guys ever done that where you, you hold together a, a model with super glue and then you, you take the, the model apart, like you, you try to drop the model and every part comes away like perfectly? So that, like almost like your pictures are forming some sort of paper puzzle, you know, to, to, to glue them. To, Put them all back together again. So you put your things back together again. Complete Space Marine. Pull your fingers apart. All component parts are nicely glued on each of your fingers. <laughs> it's happened to me at least once. It took me and Chad about two weeks to finish painting my small force. I forgot to say, when Chad sold me that army, it was at the start of 6th edition. When we finished, Chad asked me if I wanted to play a game and whilst everyone was new to the 6th edition rules, I would not be too much behind the others. I accepted, and Chad told me that Angry, an Orc player, uh, built an army for 6th edition and I could play him, since he too was new to that army. Alright, cool. Uh, and the army he had chosen to go with, with uh, the new one, was Death Guard. It was a big change for Angry, since he loved to play a green tide of Orcs going to the small elite force of Death Guard. So, we plan to have the game the next weekend at Angry's place, and here is the breakdown of both armies. Um, okay, Angry had a winged demon prince, a chaos lord on a bike, two squads of seven plague marines and rhinos, some chaos spawns, and a defiler. My army was led by Miltiades, and my chapter master in artificer armor, iron halo, and a powerful relic sword. Bonus point if you can guess where I found the name, the answer will be at the end. Let me have a little look here. Let me have a little... Miltiades, Miltiades. I'm thinking Spartan. I'm, sp I'm thinking Spartan. Um... Hmm. Was he a... Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm thinking Marathon. So I'm, that wouldn't be Spartans. That would be uh, Athenians. Was he the guy who ran Marathon? Or was he the general that at the at the Battle of Marathon? I don't know. I, I don't think he was the guy who ran. No, I, I, I'm going with general. I'm going with general. He was the guy. He was the general at the Battle of Marathon. That, that's stuff the, that I. But I'm probably wrong. He's probably the runner, isn't he? So for those of you who don't know, the word marathon comes from uh, the, the people uh, fighting at Marathon. Uh, you know, you know the, the the against the Persians. Uh, one of them had to run back to Athens to warn them not to open the gates to the Persians because everyone was, was expecting the Greeks to lose and so they would have to open the gates to the Persian army and now the other half of the Persian army was on its way to Athens so the, the marathon runner had to get there before they opened the gates and and, the, and I think it was like 26 miles or something like that which is the official marathon run now so if you run a marathon that's why it's called a marathon isn't history great anyway um, I had Miltiades, Miltiades, sorry, five assault terminators with hammers and shields, two squads of ten marines with, with laz, laser and plasma, razorback transport, a dreadnought, and my now not glued to my hands vindicator. Hooray, good. Well, Angry had the first turn, and, and he had a great one. Firstly, he put his demon prince in flying mode, so only sixes would hit him. And he managed to shake my Vindicator with his Defiler and his Chaos Lord with a spawn were really well hidden behind a ruin. So my turn rolls. And to be fair, I do not have a lot of options. I mostly move my army around to get my Terminator ready for a counter charge near where his spawn will be into charge range. In the shooting phase, phase I did not have many good targets and decided to target the Demon Prince. It took me far too much firepower to only strip a wound from the Demon Prince. With that, my turn was finished. It was back to Angry. He managed to destroy my Dreadnought and his two squad of Plague Marines. With his two squad of Plague Marines, 
He then charged my right, my right flank, like I had anticipated, with his Chaos Lord accompanied by his spawns. He kept his best for last, charging his Demon Prince into Sergeant Thales and his combat squad. Two little things here. A combat squad is when you have a 10-man un unit split into two 5-man squads on the tabletop, and Thales was my sergeant with a power fist. On the Overwatch, I managed to get a 6 on my plasma gun, stripping the demon from another wound. Okay. Angry looks a little annoyed that his demon prince is not the invincible beast he thought it was, but he is confident he, would destroy, he, he could destroy my squad. Unfortunately, he rolled really badly, only managing to kill two marines. On the riposte, Sergeant Thales punched the beast in the face, bringing it down to its last wound. My next turn is not really relevant since I only countercharged and most combat was drawn except for one. The bloody Demon Prince squashed again two marines due to poor rolling, leaving Sergeant Thales alive. With his trusty power fist, Thales ended the Demon Prince and the game, because right after that, Angry started to shout that the Death Guard were shit, my army was OP and that the game was trash in general. He then got out of the room and slammed the door, leaving me and Chad wondering what the heck had happened. So I took my stuff and we went, and we went back to Chad's place to see a movie as it was now 7.30. Also sometime later, I built a Stern Guard veteran squad I could not think of a better sergeant to lead it than Thales. He is in the picture with, with Miltiades. Okay, cool. Uh, Miltiades was the Archon leading the Athenians that repelled the Persians at the Bay of Marathon during the first Persian invasion. There you go. So I was right. Hope you liked it. And if you want some more, I have a lot more stories like that. Cool. Excellent, man. Cheers. Um, moving on to our next hobby nightmare. It is from Uber. You wouldn't think I know how to say that name, but uh, I have had Norwegian girlfriends with rather large brothers. One of which was called Uber. Anyway, hello North, you may call me Uber. I wanted to talk to you about my experience in 40k role playing and give you a story of two parts. Firstly, I will present to you the rarest, most precious type of RPG and tabletop wargaming player that I came across. A breed rarer than unicorns and white, ra and white ravens. Secondly, I will tell a funny tale of the perils of not using common sense, allowing players to exploit loopholes and playing every rule literally and to the letter when roleplaying. Okay. Let us begin. So what is this super rare type of player that I wanted to talk about? Well, I had the pleasure of meeting two examples of such a precious hobbyist. Let's call them Mr. M and Mr. D. Mr. M and Mr. D were both into role-playing games and tabletop wargaming, and 40k was their main drug of choice. Mr. M was an orc player, with all the weird and wonderful quirks that come with that, and Mr. D, if I remember correctly, was an Imperial Guard player, all about tanks and infantry battalions. Now, both of those gentlemen were quite leftist in nature, as far left as you could go politically, and Mr. D called himself a dedicated Leninist. Leninist, okay. While well, Mr. M unironically said things like, property is theft. Both were radically progressive Marxists and anarcho-syndicalists. -syn uh, I'm sure you can imagine the type. Oh no. And you said these are nice people? Okay. What made them so rare? Unlike so many radicals on the left or right, Mr. M and Mr. D left all politics at the door and never brought a word of it to the table. How- so- if they did that, then how do you know that they're this political? Uber, mate, come on. If they did that, then how do you know that, that they were like this? Unless you met them elsewhere, which is fine. To them, the setting, the law, and the spirit of the game were sacrosanct. Neither of them would dream to insert anything remotely political into a game they ran or a character they portrayed. Changing the setting or law was unimaginable to them unless it fit with said setting, and neither man would even dream of inserting any ideology into any aspect of the hobby. Mr. M could have a vicious political argument with you one day, then play a game of 40k with you the next, and cheerfully proclaim WAH as if nothing had taken place. Later, over a pint, he would gladly continue his tirades, never resisting you until you, uh, 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 until you either admitted to being Tory scum, 
or accepted the universal truth of Marxism and dialectical materialism. Yeah, this is, this is what they like, dude. Um, I'm glad you could accept them as they are, but this is not the person I would hang around with. Either you're on my side or you're, or you're a Tory. Okay. All right, dude. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. Ugh. They accepted and loved the hobby for what it was and were not in the least bit interested in projecting their own ideas onto any sphere of it. Dude, I'm too cynical for this. I, I, I'd i say that they were doing it passively through osmosis rather than anything else. Um, I, I just wouldn't be able to be, be around them. Um, it's the same with, with far-right people. I can't. I just can't. Like you, You're just assholes, all of you. On the far left and far right, I want you to get in the sea and fucking drown. Get in there. We don't need you. We don't want you. Go away. Let the thinkers, the free thinkers of the world, i.e. us, right? Get on with it and go away. Thank you. Cheers. It, it, it takes a special kind of fucking moron to dedicate yourself to an ideology that has failed several times and killed millions of people on both sides of the spectrum. You're a fucking retard if you do that. Sorry. You're just what you are. You're mentally retarded. I don't. I'm not. I'm not using it as a, as a, um, I'm not using that as a put down. By the way, I think you're literally mentally retarded, literally, and you need help. Anyway, the existence of people like Mr. M and Mr. D should be a lesson to all of us in the hobby. The hobby setting and law are sacrosanct and should not be bent to accommodate anybody's ideology. The hobby is what it is, and everybody is welcome as long as they take it and enjoy it for what it is. Not for what they want it to be. I agree. I agree. Whatever your political leanings, you can roll dice and play games and generally be around people without immediately setting about removing anybody and anything that is not you or like you. More people like this, uh, please, and less of the blue-haired Twitter activist, red pill-eating, 4chan dweller crowd. I agree. Completely. I don't agree that Mr. M and Mr. D were nice people, but I agree that uh, with your sentiment. I do. Yeah, I do. Take a sip of tea, and it's time to come back to the onto the adventure story. Okay, so I figured out a way to have my Yorkshire tea without uh, needing to give it up for my diet, and that is a little bit less milk and uh, no sugar. There you go. Go figure. Sugar's bad for you guys. Um. All right. This time. I'm going to move on to the adventure story where I am a part of the problem. I will recount a 40k role-playing campaign from well over a decade ago, so please forgive that some of the details are hazy. Okay. Is that dog still on my screen? No, it's not. Well, I'm going to put him back on again. There we go. Um, I'm going to put Nala back on the screen. Why not? Myself and a few others including the above-mentioned Mr. M and Mr. D, played as an inquisitorial retinue, sent to investigate Dark Eldar activity in a certain star system, with the assistance of Death Watch Astartes. My character was a Death Wilder and a Guard veteran, a simple and brutal man, whom I specifically built over time to be tough and hard to kill or even injure. His backstory was that on a distant world, his entire regiment became stuck behind enemy lines, with only a five-man squad of Mentor Legion Chapter Astartes. After two weeks, only a dozen or so survivors came back to the main Imperial lines, along with three remaining Astartes. This episode gave my character an affinity for, and made him fanatically loyal to, Astartes and all they represent, and this will, this will become important later. The adventure played out without anything unusual, with our group slowly but surely figuring out where the enemy strike base is and where they keep their prisoners before escaping into the webway. My character provided mostly muscle and little else, and was put into service when trouble started. Armed with his trusty flamer and a seemingly unending supply of grenades, I specifically used flamers and grenades, which I hoarded at every opportunity, but allowed it to be... Uh, because it allowed me to put XP points into toughness and agility, etc., instead of accuracy or ballistic skill, as neither of these weapons needed to hit rolls in this game. Also, an important point later on. In addition, with rules written as they are, explosion and flame damage could combine, causing insta-kills on most targets, 
even if normally few rounds, uh, uh, a few rounds of fight would be necessary to take them down. For example, if I threw a grenade and used a flamer at a target, they would suffer both damage output simultane simultaneously, instead of, say, shooting them with a las gun one shot at a time. To top it off, one could throw and shoot as part of one action, so it was possible to throw a grenade and fire a flamer in the same round. I was very aware of this loophole and exploited it like the cheeky little arsehole that I was. And I, do, you know, do you know what? That's the kind of behaviour that would get you slapped down at my table. Not literally, but I, I would do something to your character. I would take away an arm or something. I'd, I'd do something. You know what I mean? Like, like just be like, okay, you want to be cheeky? You want to try and ruin every combat encounter that I have? Alrighty. Alrighty. How's this? <laughs> and then just... Because they learn the lesson. Most most players learn the lesson. Go right, okay, yeah, I pushed a bit too far there. No problem, you know. At a certain point near the end of the adventure, I had to skip two sessions for reasons I couldn't help. In game, it was explained that my character went into a coma after an injury and woke up in time for the final session, fresh-faced and unaware of anything that had happened in the preceding two games. Now, to, to prevent meta gaming, none of the other players informed me of what had happened in the previous two sessions. So I was in the same position as my character. You'd think that at this point one of the players w would think to inform me in character where I'd missed out on, but nobody did. Me, being focused on role-playing a slightly demented version of Rambo, did not think to ask either. Beyond a, uh, did I miss any fights? line, and the only response was, uh, just follow our lead, we have a plan, everything will be okay. Okay. At a later point, the entire party, Death Watch Astartes included, made their way to an abandoned building, taking suspiciously few precautions and suspiciously not bothered how it was difficult to get in or out of. In there, a cabal of Drukhari emerged. As we got surrounded, one of our party members, the informal leader, stepped forth, greeted the, the Drukhari leader and said something along the lines of, we have delivered you the first sacrifices as agreed. The rest await your leisure at an agreed place. We await your reward and pledge our allegiance to your cause. What? What happened? Well, the party had, in secret, managed to contact the Drakari and somehow convince them that they should make a deal. All of the Imperial forces delivered on a platter, starting with the Astartes and with an Inquisitor to boot. In return, they would get some Archaeotech, a never-before-seen STC blueprint, and their lives would be spared. This was, in fact, a ruse. The Inquisitor knew all about it and had set up a perimeter with a strong strike force to wipe out the Cabal as they came out to get their hands on their first lot of sacrifices. My character knew nothing of this ruse, as nobody had bothered to explain what was going on. All he understood that the man before him had just betrayed the Imperium, the Emperor and his fellow humans to foul Xenos, and, even worse, betrayed his beloved Astartes in the process. As soon as it was my turn to act, instead of asking what was going on or keeping my eyes open and my mouth, sh and my mouth shut, I did what I thought a guy like this would do in this position. I pulled out my bolt pistol and shot the offending party member in the back of the head. <laughs> I thought you were going to get your flamer out and just like roast him there. That'd be so funny. Roll damage, instant kill. Poor player was not even, had not, sorry, was not even given a chance to duck, de detect, or sidestep the shot, as per the rules. It was not their turn to act, and the GM refused to ever step outside of the rules as written mindset. Well, this is what you get. This is what you get when you, when you, you do black and white. This is what you get. Mayhem. To everybody's credit, no one paused the game, and after a few ah and oohs, the game carried on, and the player I shot had an expression that said, well... That escalated quickly. Later, he did admit openly betraying the Imperium in front of Death World, uh, in front of a Death World veteran was not the smartest idea, and that someone should have told me what was going on before we went into that building. Everyone's rounds came, and the players either ducked for cover or heft weapons whilst ducking for cover. Drakari's uh, turn, uh, the, the Drakari's turn, consisted of them jumping out at me and the party on the Astartes and firing shots mostly at me in the Death Watch, with, with uh, which kill no one just yet. The Death Watch open fires and kills Adrikari each. Cue my turn. 
my character hefts at the flamer and starts spraying everything in range and burning Prometheum. Dealing increased damage because of, of how close the Drakari are at this point. With his offhand, he, uh, he, oh, sorry, he also throws a few grenades in the enemy's general direction. Using a flamer one-handed was a skill I had specifically worked on. Madness ensues. Burning fuel sprayed in a wide arc, combi com uh, combined with multiple explosions with overlapping blast radiuses. Results in an insta-kill for almost every Dakari within 20 feet of me. Every shot fired at me either fails to damage or only does a little bit due to how tough my character was to injure and the gear he was wearing. Dukari focus fire on me and the, and the Astartes, forgetting about the party almost entirely, which allows them to join the fight. From what I remember, however, they, they, they only did little, as they were thinkers and not fighters. Fights were quite rare in our adventure, and it was my Death World veteran's job to get them done if and when they happened. Mostly, the players just wanted to keep out of harm's way. In my turn, I continued the rampage, spraying everything and everybody in sight with flames and throwing as many grenades around me as the rules allow me to, injuring some of my own party members in the process. The enemy attempts to stop my character again, uh, and again that came to nothing, as even with serious injuries, the rules allowed me to continue fighting and the GM applied them in every situation exactly as they were written. The mayhem continued. I'm going to take a little drink here, because uh, this is quite, this is engrossing. Alright, eventually, the flame of fuel finally ran out, so I threw the last of my grenades using both hands, two at a time, wiping out any Xenos that the Astartes had failed to kill. I survived, but was seriously injured. Few others had suffered wounds and burns, and the only party member to die was the one I had personally executed. In the chaos, the GM had actually forgotten about the Inquisitor and his forces lying in ambush outside, as they never took part in the fighting. Turns out confined spaces combined with flames and explosions did not bode well for Xeno life expectancy. In the end, the Inquisitorial ambush, the deal with the Xenos, the carefully laid out perimeter and the death of one of the, of one of the characters were all unnecessary. As one of the other players put it, we worked our arses off for two sessions to lay down a plan and an ambush, making the Dark Eldar believe us, picking a perfect site for the encounter, putting the Inquisitor and his forces in perfect hiding spots, getting the Dark Eldar to actually come out and greet us, only for you to waltz in and single-handedly burn the entire Cabal to a crisp. The worst thing was, the entire party realised that this could have been done right away, and all their schemes and plans were just wasted effort. We could have just busted the Drakari base, guns blazing, and probably still win the day. Well, that's true, but I think a combination of your plans would have been best, right? So that you guys plan for this to happen, and then you're like the surprise. You know, you're surprised, motherfucker, and you're there with your, you know, and, and all hell breaks loose. That would have been fine. It was a shame none of us had the presence of mind to get my character up to speed on what the actual plan was before the shit hit the fan. In addition to the... Let the to the letter application of the rules allowed something to happen that was, for a common from a common sense point of view, not only ridiculous but downright impossible if you think about it. One guardsman and a few Astartes killing most of an entire cabal. Players and GMs alike do not be afraid to apply a little common sense to a situation when a player does something as stupid as I did. Give them consequences, even if the rules would not. Not to mention, keep an eye out for players who, like me, push the envelope of what is possible and come up with cheesy exploits the rules. We had several more adventures after, but never repeated the same level of silliness and seem to have learned our lesson. Thanks for reading, Uber. Okay, um, I agree, mate. I agree with every... I, I think, I think uh, you and I are on very similar wavelengths in terms of, of, of mental, uh, both politically and otherwise. I think we are very, very similar, so thank you for sending in your hobby nightmare. And I agree. I agree. As a GM, you need to introduce consequences to your players, even if the rules say that they don't need any. They do. They just do, right? That just is what it is. They just do. Every single player out there, if they if they start to, you know, shall I say, fixate on bending the rules to their own whims, sort of a thing. I know this because I write rules. I've written RPGs before that my friends have played. And there's always a few of your friends who always seem to, shall we say, 
push the envelope <laughs> a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, and being the writer of the rules, I'm very, I'm very quick to turn around and go, just because I wrote them, you know, it doesn't mean I can't change them on a fly if I think they're broken, right? If you think you're breaking them too easily. Anyway, let's run in, shall we, and do our next hobby nightmare from Zips. Hi, North. You can call me Zips. Or Zaps. Sorry, not Zips. It's Zaps. Okay. Apologies. I'll crack that. Hi, North. You can call me Zaps. I was into the hobby as a teenager back in the hallowed 90s, when you could spend a full Saturday playing in a store. I spent many a weekend at my local games workshop, clutching a hot three pounds and fifty pence in my hand, perusing an army of lead models. But time and life paused my hobby until my late thirties, when I joined a friendly local gaming club to get back into something that brought me so much joy. A few years later, and I had made some true friends for life through wargaming, which, as we all know, is hard when you're older, so I'm grateful for the hobby in my life. It's done wonders for my mental health too. I listened to Hobby Nightmares when painting, and that's what prompted me to tell this story. Buckle in North, tea at the ready, let's go. There's a guy at my local club, let's call him Dave. <laughs> I can tell you what's the channel or not. Alright. Dave is around my age, uh, but he's been playing all of his life and is very un uh, and is very welcoming to new players. Always up for organising a game with them and showing them the ropes. He's a genuinely nice bloke, but as soon as he hits the tabletop, it's like he's possessed by a twat. <laughs> Not in a good way, I suspect. I played Dave a few times, and when I got back into the hobby, I was brand new to 40k. Dave played Drakari, and I played Tyranids. This was back in 9th edition. Dave tabled me consistently, but I didn't mind. I was new, I was inexperienced, and I wanted to learn. I figured playing somebody this good can only help with my own play, right? Dave was nice as well. We had a good chat, and he would always tell me where I'd gone wrong, and what he'd had done to counter me. That was great, or oh, so I thought. Gradually, as I played more games against different people at the club, I realised there were much more that there was much more enjoyment on offer than getting obliterated by turn two with Dave. There were close games, fun games, and, like I say, friends to be made, and I even won once or twice. I realised something else too. There was an undercurrent of dislike between everybody else and Dave. No one liked playing him. In fact, everybody avoided playing him. But why? I naively thought. Just because he's good? Surely not. But as I got better at the game, and more familiar with the rules, there were some strange things about Dave's play that I started to notice. He never used a codex. Never used a... Okay, okay, I, I've j just... First things first there, you know. If you don't, you don't have your codex on you or you don't use official rules, if you try and use rules off the top of your head, I'm not playing you. Just That's it. I'm not playing you. I don't, I'd don't. i rather trust a book or Games Workshop's official rules on your laptop or whatever than your fucking brain. Alright? Because brains misremember things. Usually in its own favour. You know? He never used a codex, never used a counter or anything to keep track of his points, etc., and he would subtly doctor his dice rolls, adding a few more hits than he'd actually rolled, adding pluses to his saves out of nowhere, bringing back entire units that were dead with no explanation save for. Right, now all of these come back. What? Wow. Playing against Dave was, was becoming an utterly joyless experience. He just had to win. And stop playing him, dude. You just realise you've got other people to play with. Stop playing Dave. It's fine. Now, just to let you know, I am the opposite of a competitive player. What brings me joy is painting models, making making up stories, chatting whilst rolling dice, and playing out narrative battles. The result is literally meaningless to me. I love set seeing a mad dice roll or a weird thing happening, even if it's me rolling constant ones. It happens. It's funny. My friend Andy and I still talk about the time my Hive Tyrant's head exploded as it suffered perils, whilst trying to unleash a psychic attack on his ultramarines. Initially, I felt a bit sorry for Dave. Like I say, off the table, he seemed lovely. But the more I got to know him, and the more I realised that wargaming, no, just winning, seemed deeply, intrinsically important to him, 
If you so much as killed a single one of his models, his entire demeanor changed. He would sulk and shrug and moan on and on about how the rules were stupid and didn't make sense if anything went against him. Honestly, it was just sad to see a man in his mid-40s so emotionally connected to winning. I began to pity him. This was until the campaign. Take a sip of tea, North. We're going deeper into the sphere of the ultimate man-baby. Alright, okay. Let's get this on the go. One sec. There we go. Dave, of course, won all of his games in our narrative campaign. A few people dropped out, fed up with playing Dave, who had to win at all costs. He brought metalists to every battle and wasn't uh, and which were, was not in the spirit of the campaign at all. Then it came to me in Dave's battle. Again, bear in mind, David won all of his games up until now. The last time we'd played, he changed his damage output and everything and brought back his units constantly that couldn't come back like usual. Dude, that's so obvious cheating. Why are you playing this guy? But in the meantime, I had checked the Drakari rules. In this game, I called him out on every single rule he misused and he got progressively more and more pissed off. That's how we played last time, he said. I know, man, I said. That's the rules. I checked. On went the game. My Neurothrope was a tough one to kill because of the upgrades I'd given it. I attacked Dave's Talos mainly because I was getting fed up and knew he had this weird obsession with that model. It was his favourite. Like you always say, North, hobby time is precious and Dave was ruining mine now. Dave's attitude had sapped all the fun from the game and I just wanted it to be over. I managed to kill his Talos and Dave glared at me. That's my favourite model, he said, simmering with fury. I'm close to flipping this fucking table. I honestly thought he was joking. This is a man in his mid-forties playing toy soldiers. I stared back at him. Um, okay, I said. You know what your problem is, Dave said. You only bring elite models, elite units. I hate Tyranids. That Neuronthrope is the best unit in the entire fucking game. He, it wasn't, you know what I mean, but okay. He got personal with me, and I'd had enough. I'm known by everybody in the club for my f fluffy attitude to the hobby. I'm known for not being that good, and I've never come close to beating Dave. He's tabled me every single time I've played him. How dare he accuse me of doing what he does every single time. But I'm also a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Oh, shit. You know what's coming. You know what's coming. I'm not intimidated by a fat ass man babies like Dave. It was my turn for a demeanor change. I shrugged and went quiet. I smoldered, just rolled my dice and got on with the game. Dave noticed this immediately. I bet he takes this for weakness and starts to bully you or try to. I'd, I'd have preferred it if he'd shouted, got angry, told me I was a cheat, a meta chaser, an awful person. At least he'd have some shown some courage in his conviction. But no. Suddenly, now that I was beginning to lose my shit, Dave was my best mate. He wasn't blaming me. Oh no, it was the game's fault. It was Games Workshop's fault. He tried to make desperate, sycophantic small talk for the rest of the game. I wasn't going to his level of uh, to, I wasn't going to go to his level and sulk. I was courteous, polite, and we finished the game. He won. It was like letting a toddler beat you at a game because they're not mature enough yet to be able to handle defeat. I told everybody in the group chat about Dave Tantrum and how he accused me of taking elite units and we had a good laugh about it. Everybody else had a similar, had, had a similar story about Dave. His tantrums when certain units were killed, his cheating and his desperation to win. Ultimately, I still play Dave a bit. Winning at 40k seems more important than a game to him. Defends, sorry, winning at 40k seems more important than the game. Defends the hobby on, uh, as a whole. Dave's always moaning about the game. He seems to hate it but can't stop playing it. His only joy seems to be winning and that's quite sad. I recently found out he's banned from all local tournaments and hobby stores for being the way he is. I wonder what happened in his life to make him this way and I wish he could just enjoy the hobby. You know, the hobby. Needless to say, I won't be playing him again but underneath it all, that's a nice guy 
that there is a nice guy in there, I'm sure of it. My question is, I guess, is whether somebody like Dave is to be pitied. Obviously, there's some trauma playing out in his obsession with winning. I suspect he hasn't had many, many wins in his life, and maybe 40k is the only place where he feels powerful. If that's the case, I think I do feel sorry for, for the Daves of this world. If only he could see the positives in the game, rather than the result, the friends to be made, and the fun to be had. Cheers, North. Love the channel. Take care, Zaps. Okay, um, well, I'll leave that to... I'm going to answer that myself, but I'll leave a little bit of that to the people who are watching the video. In the comment section down below, do you pity Dave, and where do you think his behaviour comes from? For me, um, there is, as you just said, some deep-seated trauma in here. Uh, this is a guy who's lost a lot in his early life. This can be through bullying, this can be through having a family that is obsessed with winning and always pushing you to win, even though you can't, do you know what I mean? Um, a lot of kids who are from very sporty families, and who aren't very sporty themselves, tend to end up like this. You know, they tend to end up taking out all of that trauma on the people around them whilst they're playing 40k and other games like it, right? Because they all tend to be nerds. So any nerds brought up in a very sporty family where all of their siblings are doing well in sports tend to be like this. You know? Well, I don't mean tend to be like this. I mean, like, the people who tend to be this tend to be from backgrounds like that, right? So if you're from that kind of background and you're not like this, all power to you. You know, I, I get that. But most of the people who, who, who do things like this are from backgrounds where they've lost all their lives. You know what I mean? Uh, it can be when they were bullied when they were younger. Well, if they had a family that really pushed them and belittled them when they were younger. They have serious confidence issues and now finally they get a chance to win at something. And they're not going to let it slide. You know what I mean? It's something that you need therapy for, dude. You, you need therapy. You absolutely need therapy. Um, I'm lucky because my, my therapist, Ryan, he's actually a sports therapist. So recently we got to working on that part of my personality because I hate losing, right? Um, and we got to that work, uh, work on that part of my personality. That's how I know that a lot of people who feel this way and go to the extremes that Dave does have come from such backgrounds. You know? What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section down below. Nala was a lovely dog. She says goodbye. And I'm going to say goodbye to you too. I will speak to you tomorrow. Uh, either for some more Hobby Nightmares or for a 40k rant. I have not decided yet. Or we may do some of your custom Space Marine chapters. That'll be cool. All right. Love you all. See you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye now.